one of the more popular TV shows in recent years has been Seinfeld. Now, I don't know how many Seinfeld watchers we have here today, but it broke all kinds of records as a TV sitcom. What was interesting about Seinfeld is that it was noted not to have a plot. That is, nothing connected with anything. You know, he would show up and start off with this kind of gag routine and go on to the show and nothing seemed to have much to do with anything. It was a plotless sitcom. And it went to the top of the charts. They were analyzing why Seinfeld was so popular and it was concluded that Seinfeld was popular because the folk watching it were in the same situation as a sitcom. <laughs> Plotless. No clue. Aimlessly going from situation to situation. Sitcom. Going from one day to another day, one job to another job, one place to another place, without rhyme or reason, unconnected. Most Christians today are living decaffeinated lives. All the lead is gone. And like a hamster on the wheel, ever moving, never arriving anywhere. I don't know how many Sunday drivers we have here. People who simply like to get on the road and just drive. You don't really, you're not really going anywhere. You just want to drive. It's a pretty day. Let's go riding. Well, I'm, I'm a driver, I love to drive, but, but even I must admit, after a while, that gets old. Because you're not going anywhere. You're just out there. Far too many of us are living lives like the flicker of a candle rather than the blazing of the noonday sun. Meandering, no brilliance, no significance. We don't really feel that we matter that much because there is no sense of ultimate purpose, destiny, or the word we're going to use in our series, calling. Your calling may be defined as the customized life purpose God has ordained for you. The customized life purpose God has ordained for you to accomplish in order to bring him the greatest glory and the maximum expansion of his kingdom. Your calling, your reason for being, is your customized life purpose which God has ordained for you and you alone to accomplish which is designed to bring him greatest glory and the maximum expansion of his kingdom there are three things I want to say about this definition of calling which has to do with your purpose for being. First of all, it is a created purpose. Purpose, calling, it's your reason for being. It's the reason why you were made. You were made to fulfill your calling. A car is not fulfilling its calling if it doesn't run. A piano is not fulfilling its calling if all the strings are broke and there is no tune coming out. It's not fulfilling the purpose for which it was produced. It's there, but it's not doing anything or certainly not doing its ordained thing. 
To live life without purpose or calling is to be like the Dead Sea over in Israel. No life there. It's death. Fish can't swim in it. You can't swim in it. You get the salt in your eyes, it'll burn you. It is a lifeless existence because it is not fulfilling its purpose. You see, you can't flow out of the Dead Sea. It's the lowest point on planet Earth and, and water runs in it. It just has nowhere to go. Far too many of us are living Dead Sea kind of lives. No outlet, no progress. Perpetual stagnation. No calling. God did not create you for fun. He created you for purpose. He didn't just look up one day and say, oh, I'm bored. Let me come up with something to do today. Why don't I make folk? No. You were made with a purpose. You see this at the very beginning of the Bible. This created purpose. And we could go through the whole first chapter, but let's just look at a couple of items here. Uh, verse 14 of Genesis 1 says, Then God said, Let there be light in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And God, verse 16, made two great lights, the greater light, to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God didn't just wake up one day and say, oh, I'm bored, why don't I just throw something up there to shine? He said, no. No, let me make two great lights. One that will govern the day. It will determine how bright the day gets. The other one will govern the night and it will have a supporting cast of stars. In other words, he made the sun, he made the moon, and he made the stars for a reason. Not just to do it. Not because he had nothing better to do. It was an intelligent, thought-through reason. Verse 20, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth in open expanse of the heavens. Well, if he's going to create waters, it's natural that he's going to create sea monsters, he says in verse 21. That is the fish of the sea, the big ones. If you didn't know it, fish were made to swim. You show me a fish that's not in the swimming, and I'll show you a depressed beast. Because it was made to swim. The beasts on the field, in the field, they weren't made to swim. And if they try to live in the water, they live dead sea lives because they're not fulfilling their purpose. That's not their sphere of operation. That's not what they were called to do. He says about man, In verse 26, let us make man our own image according to likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, birds of the sky, the cattle of the earth, and all the creeping things. And God created man in his own image. He says in verse 28, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. He doesn't just say, let us make man. He says, let us make man because we have something for him to do. Not, not, not just be there, not just meander around, not just go around and notice how beautiful the animals are and how wonderful it is to float on the water, there has got to be more to life than this. Most of us spend a lot of time making a living, not a lot of time making a life. And so we suffer from what I call the same old, same old disease. Every day you get up out of that same old bed and you go to that same old bathroom to look in the same old mirror at that same old face, go to that same old closet to look at those same old clothes to put it on that same old body to go to that same old breakfast table, eat that same old breakfast cooked by that same old wife. 
You know, you get in the same old car and go to the same old work, down that same old road, work next to them same old people for that same old pay, doing that same old job, and you go back down that same old road, into that same old house, hear that same old noise from those same old kids. Pick up that same old remote, sit down there and go over those same old programs. Go to the dinner table and eat that same old dinner from that same old cook. You know, and go to bed and wake up the next day to rehearse that same old routine. And there's nothing wrong with routine if it's tied to purpose. But if it's routine tied to nothing, you wind up like Deanna Warwick raising the question, what's it all about, Alfie? <laughs> no manufacturer designs and markets a product until he's determined what it's for. You don't, you don't, you don't go make something and market it and not be able to answer the question what you do with it. But when you live your life raising the question, why am I here? That question, however you phrase it, that's a question of purpose. It's a question of calling. When God created, he created with a purpose. Now let me tell you a secret. The created thing cannot tell you, watch this, its purpose until its creator tells the created thing what its purpose is. Now, come on, let's do an exercise. Everybody here sitting on a pew, right? Ask that pew what it's here for. Go, don't look at me. Ask the pew what it's here for. That pew has no knowledge of its reason for being. That's determined by somebody else. I'm talking to you over a microphone right now. If I were to ask the mic, Mike, why are you here? The mic couldn't tell me. It was the creator of the mic that says why the mic is here. One of the reasons we can't find our calling is because we're trying to tell ourselves why we were called. That was deep, man, that I think about. It. <laughs> we're trying to self-define our calling. A calling assumes a caller. If the phone is ringing, somebody else is calling you. God is the caller, you are the callee. He is the manufacturer, you are the product. That's why you can never discover your calling apart from God. It's impossible to discover your calling apart from God. But far too many of us are functioning outside of our divinely ordained reason for being, or we're not functioning in it at all, which means we are existing. And when you exist, you have to create callings. You have to make stuff up. Now, when you get a bunch of folk who don't know they're calling, living in the same house, you got a miserable place to live. Because he don't know why he's there, she don't know why she's there, so that already in a frustration, you put on top of that just the regular trials and tribulations of life. There is nothing that is calling them that is bigger than who they are. The successful single versus the defeated single is the distinction between the called one and the one who does not know their calling. The one who does not know their calling thinks all of life is wrapped up in that man or woman they have not yet found and God has not yet supplied. The one who is not frustrated, still desiring, but not frustrated, is because they have been called to something bigger that no other person can fix for them. They are into something so much bigger. Let me 
show you a great verse. Acts chapter 13, verse 36. What a wonderful verse. The book of Acts. It's in the New Testament. After John. Chapter 13, verse 36. Listen to this. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. What a great verse. You say, I don't see nothing great about that verse. That verse says, the man died, became worm food, underwent decay. One, he didn't die until he had completed his purpose. What a horrible way to die, never knowing why you showed up in the first place. What a horrible thing to do to live 75, 80, 85 years and all you can talk about is your job. In fact, we got folk in the 30 and 35 years old who all they can talk about is retiring from their job. Because you hate to get up in the morning, you hate where you're going when you get up in the morning, you hate the people you're going to see when you get there because they got up in the morning like you did. It's just one miserable thing. What is missing? Your calling. Proverbs 29, 18 says that without a vision, without a word from God, people perish. What he's saying is that when people have no direction in life, they wither. They die. So this is not a small subject. This is not an insignificant subject. God said of Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5, while you were in your mama's womb, I called you. Boy, that's great news that God calls in advance. So calling is critical, but it's tied to your creation. You were created with a calling. Everybody in here who is saved, who has accepted Jesus Christ by faith alone, who has been born into God's family has been called. Once you receive the call to salvation, God now gives you the call to life's purpose. Secondly, it's not only a created purpose, it is a customized purpose. Nobody has your call but you. Let me say that's good news. Nobody, and I mean nobody, has your call but you. Nothing else matters any more than knowing that you're fulfilling the purpose for which you are placed on the earth. Nothing. Once you hit that, then you can sing like one great song person, you can't touch this. Because once you have that, you are now alive. You are alive. I am never more alive than when I stand up here. I had a sister tell me, she said, you sure come to life up there. I, I was thought, now, what you, what you trying to say? <laughs> I'm a boring person down there, maybe? That's because this is my calling. I used to preach on street corners, in front of bus stops in Atlanta, Georgia. So I wait for folks to gather at the bus stop, and I stand up in the front of the bus stop and start preaching. You must be born again. Every Friday night, I'd lead a group of students out in college, and I'd preach, you must be born again. Same sermon, because that's all I knew. <laughs> but I was called. <laughs> Let me tell you what will happen. If you do not pursue your calling, you'll spend your life wishing you were somebody else. 
Now think about that because that was a little deep too. <laughs> You're not happy with who you are. That's because you've not yet discovered who you are. David says in Psalm 139, I am fearfully and wonderfully made because I am distinct. In fact, this principle is, is, is biologically solidified. Your fingerprint is not like your neighbor's free fingerprint. Every fingerprint in this room and in the world is distinctly different. It's hard now to commit a crime because now they discovered how to get DNA off of everything. That's another subject. But they can get DNA now. They can track you down. Why? Because your DNA is uniquely yours. What is true of your fingerprint, what is true of your DNA is true of your calling. Nobody has your calling but you because nobody is you but you. So the, the beautiful thing about it is it's customized calling. It's calling with your name on it. Jesus says, I finished the work which my father gave me to do. He gave me my own job, my own special reason for being, and I completed that task. That is, I fulfilled my purpose for being. My wife wrote a book, uh, her, her first full single book, Seasons of the Woman's Life, and some of it's drawn from Esther. And of course, Esther's key statement is in chapter 4, where now Esther is a beautiful woman. She's a fox. She's a bad mamma jamma. She's, you know, she's, she's got it all together. And her beauty causes her to be selected by Ahasuerus as his new bride. He saw her and said, oh, shoot, whoa. And he takes her. So she gets all comfortable in the king's house because she now live in large. She in the big house. She's got money, she's got cars, she's got clothes. While the Jewish people were in trouble and about to be extinguished, genocide. Her uncle Mordecai says, well, aren't you going to help us? She said, I can't help y'all. Because me and the king, we kind of not talking for the last 30 days and he might get irritated, so, you know, I'll pray for you. <laughs> Mordecai then writes her back, and that's the chapter four, and it's a zinger. He writes her back, Evans translation, girlfriend, don't think that you're going to escape just because you didn't moved uptown. So don't think just because you moved uptown now, you, you're not in the hood no more. You're not living with the rest of us anymore. That somehow you have escaped all this because when the hammer comes down and they find out who you are, you're going to be just like the rest of us. Secondly, don't think that God can't do this without you. Because if he can't use you, he'll call somebody else. All right? But then after hitting her with the negative stuff, he hits her with this positive line. The positive line is this. Have you ever considered, girlfriend, that you have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this? Have you ever considered God made you pretty so that Ahasuerus would fall in love with you because he knew the Jews were going to be in trouble and so he wanted to have one of his people in a strategic position at the right time to fulfill their calling for a greater purpose than you just being able to shop and customize your wardrobe. In other words, 
Esther was to look at her life in terms of her calling, not merely in terms of her money, her status, her cars, her houses, and her stuff. She was to look at it in terms of her reason for being called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Proverbs 25, 20 verse 5 says, The purposes of man of a man's heart are deep waters, but the man of understanding draws them out. In other words, a person who's serious searches for their calling, wants to know their calling. They're not satisfied to exist. They want to know why they're existing. Great verse, you all know it. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God. Now watch this. And are called according to his calling and purpose are linked. Watch this now. Calling and purpose are linked. And for the purpose person who knows their calling, so they're fulfilling their purpose, everything that happens is working that thing out. Everything that's happened is working that thing out. I know some of you are thinking, you know, well, oh boy, what if I miss my calling? <laughs> then you need what I had to do today. I had to go up to the place I bought my car from because they had a recall. <laughs> That's right. Something wasn't right on the door, so they recalled it. That's called grace. Grace is when God recalls you. But that's a whole nother message whenever I get to that. All right. Thirdly, finally, it is a comprehensive purpose. It is a comprehensive purpose. It's a created purpose. You were created for your calling. It's customized. It's yours and yours and nobody else's. You are unique as you are. You don't have to be somebody else. Why would you want to be somebody else, by the way? God already has one of them. Duh. No, he already has one of them. If you become them, them, then he doesn't have one of you. I, I, I think it's deep, but I don't put you. <laughs> Your purpose, here's, here's, where, here's why many people don't find their calling. Because their calling is not linked into anything bigger than themselves. Once you live life with a mindset of me, myself, and I, once you take this independent view of life, God will not show you your calling. Because he has called you to something bigger than you. If you have a piece of a puzzle... It is therefore incomplete if you only have one piece of a puzzle and don't have a puzzle. It's incomplete because that piece belongs to something bigger. Until that individual piece of the puzzle can be related to something that is bigger, it loses its significance. You got a piece of puzzle over here and it's not tied to the puzzle. That piece, no matter how pretty the picture is on the cardboard, is insignificant. Why are so many of us feeling insignificant? Because we're pieces without a puzzle. And we get all hyped because we're a pretty piece. My piece is prettier than your piece, you know. What matter? What does it matter with all these pieces of a puzzle sitting out in front of me if they never connect? You still don't have a picture. It loses its significance. Many Christians are like puzzle. They're beautiful cardboards. But they don't see the picture. What's the picture? What is this bigger thing God has called all of us to? All of us to. I said in the definition. 
It is the maximizing of God's glory and the expansion of his kingdom. That's it. That's it. If you are a Christian, whatever you are called to do will achieve those things. Let me say that again. Whatever, 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 whatever God calls you to do will give him greater glory and will expand his kingdom in history. The Bible says in Romans eleven thirty six 36, that all things are to him and through him and for him, to him be the glory. That men may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I can tell you now, if you are a secret agent Christian, God won't tell you your calling. Because that means he won't get more glory from your life. And if your purpose is not tied in to the expansion of his kingdom. Now what is God's kingdom? God's kingdom is his master plan. God's kingdom is his comprehensive rule over all of his creation. To be involved in your calling means that the presence of God is being manifested to a greater degree because you are fulfilling your calling. Now let me tell you, here's where we get mixed up and it's preacher's fault on this one. It's, it's, it's a preacher's fault. Because we have limited the word calling to professional ministerial occupation. In other words, call to preach. Or call, God has called me into the ministry. Okay? That language messes stuff up. Because you have been called into his kingdom. Colossians 1.13 says you have been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of, uh, of, of his dear son. Every Christian is part of the kingdom. That means all work for, becomes kingdom activity, even if it's quote-unquote secular. Okay? In fact, it's technically incorrect to make the distinction between secular and sacred because if you're a kingdom person, it is sacred. Even if you're washing dishes, you wash them sacredly. Even if you're producing a widget, you do it sacredly. Because you're fulfilling a calling, if that is, happens to be your calling. And we'll talk about that because calling may not necessarily be your occupation. I was talking to a young lady a couple of years ago. And she works for Billy Graham world famous evangelist Dr. Billy Graham and she inputs data been doing it for years she said oh I love what I do yeah yeah but I love it you like sitting there? Yeah, I love it well, why she said because this is my calling how is that your calling? God called me, she said, to help expand the ministry of Dr. Billy Graham using my computer background and skills. So I don't just sit down and input. I know that a name I put in to that computer bank has just been led to Christ in one of those crusades. And I understand that the letter and the book that I'm sending out to them has eternal value and that gives me purpose. Not because she was called to input in the computer. That's not her calling. That was her job. Her calling was to support the ministry of Billy Graham. And in that calling, she does that job. The calling is always bigger than you because it's always expanding God's kingdom and bringing God glory, whether it's in a medical field, whether it's as a lawyer, whether it's as a doctor, whether it's as a janitor. If you are called, it has eternal repercussions. And God will always be seen in it and through it. And it'll be so natural. That's a whole nother subject. How do I know... Most of you know you're calling, but don't know you know it. <laughs> uh, 
And I, I'll give you a little down payment right now. Here it is. One of the ways you know you're calling is that you would do it anyway if nobody paid you. If nobody ever gave you a dime to do it, you'd still do it because it's like Paul, woe is me if I don't. Or like Jeremiah, it's like fire shut up in my bones and I can't shake it. It burns me. It sets me aflame. Now watch this now. Watch this. My time is running out. Watch this now. Because it's kingdom, it always involves discipleship. The kingdom of God is God's comprehensive rule. The process of discipleship is bringing people in line with that comprehensive rule. So therefore, if you are a kingdom person fulfilling your calling, those around you who you affect, you will infect with this kingdom worldview because it's going gonna, it's gonna to rub off on them to some degree. Now, now watch this. When this happens, you will be part of the greatest coup d'etat in history. And the reason you will be part of the greatest coup d'etat in history is that when you fulfill your calling in the kingdom, rubbing off on other people so that they are investigating this kingdom too, you are now confiscating the goods of hell and bringing them into the realm of heaven. Your job is to go out there into the world with your calling, representing the kingdom and confiscating that which has been stolen by Satan so it can be used by the kingdom of God. That is what your job is. Do you know why the kingdom doesn't have more? Because we have people who leave the kingdom with no calling and therefore do whatever they do out there and it stays out there. It never is harnessed for the kingdom of God. That's why Paul says in chapter 1 of Ephesians that God has done this, that he might bring all things, the sum of all things, under the authority of Jesus Christ. We are his body and we are sent to be the fulfillment of all things. That is everywhere. He calls people in every direction. You don't have to feel bad if you're not called to be a preacher, if you're not called to be a missionary. Certain people should be called and you won't be fulfilled unless you respond to that call. But God is also calling people to be entrepreneurs and he's calling people to be doctors and lawyers and engineers and he's calling people to be politicians and, the, and actors and actresses and he's calling people to invade hell with the kingdom so that heaven grows that's what the Lord's prayer is all about you know we went over there our father who art in heaven I know who you are you're my father and I know where you live way up there and so because I know who you are and where you live hallowed be thy name so since your name is going to be hollowed, i got to reverse my, my, my plans so that thy kingdom comes. Which means i got to redo my life's plan so that thy will is done. Now if I'm going to hollow your name, serve as your kingdom, and do your will, then I'm going to need you to supply me the goods, the carbohydrates, the starches, and the fats so that I have enough physiological energy to hollow your name, serve as your kingdom, and do your will. So why don't you give me today the daily bread I need to pull that off? And then because you want a pure vessel, forgive me for the things I've done against you as I forgive those who've done things against me because if I don't forgive those who've done things against me, you won't forgive me who's done things against you. And if you don't forgive me who's done things against you, you will not accept me hollowing your name, servicing your kingdom, or doing your will. Then lead me not into temptation because if you lead me into anything I can't handle, I'm going to embarrass your name, embarrass your kingdom, and embarrass your will. And the only reason... I'm praying any of this anyway is because it has absolutely nothing to do with me. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. You're part of something bigger. Something bigger. And so we close. Every few months, we ordain a minister here at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship. We have an ordination meeting, and the young man who's gone to seminary or studied comes up, and he sits down ready to be bombarded with all manner of theological, biblical, practical, ministerial questions. He's nervous. He's sweating. He's wondering whether he will make 
the ordaining cut. But that's never where the process starts. I always open it up with one simple phrase. Tell me about your call. Because I don't care how much Bible you know. If you haven't been called, them folk going to run you up out of there. Show you right. Them folk going to run you up. If you haven't been called. If I wasn't called, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> you got to be called to deal with folk. Folk could kill you. And Jesus already died for you once, so I don't need to die for you too. <laughs> you got to be called. You've got to know this is the work God wants you to do. Because when the hard time comes, sometimes all you have is your call. All you have is your call. And when they pass the exam, they get the title reverend. They are now identifiable as duly appointed, duly called ministers. While the reverends are not the only ordained folk around. Every person who names the name of Jesus Christ has been ordained. And you have the call of God on your life. Or as the old folks put it, a charge to keep I have. 